I want to tell you guys what I did this weekend. I installed Google Home Mini, and I started to talk to my computer. Hmm. Um, I'm of the generation where talking to your computer was a sign of insanity. And to find out that Google Home Mini not only knew my name, right, but could start to answer very, very interesting questions was, for me, a transformative moment. Uh, if I go back to the last, over the last year, uh, we can talk a lot, lots of things here, here, here at the conference. We have seven products with more than a billion users. We're uploading 1.2 billion photos a day. YouTube is 500 hours of video uploaded per minute. We've now mapped every single country, all 200 of them, uh, pretty thoroughly. We're now 100% renewable globally in terms of our total corporate energy use, which is a very large number. But I think what's even more interesting is what has happened uh, in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, and let's take a look at cancer. Uh, for breast cancer, a high school student in Chicago has used TensorFlow to solve a new problem in breast cancer detection. Uh, in skin cancer, Stanford researchers are using uh, TensorFlow to do better uh, skin cancer diagnostics than the equivalent dermatologists, uh, et cetera. The diabetic retinopathy, which is a disease that causes premature blindness in many, many Americans and a huge number of people in impoverished worlds, uh, part of the world, um, it's a major source of blindness. We can now detect that with huge accuracy compared to what humans can do. Predicting medical events, hospital care, all of these are being transformed by this technology. In science, it's even more profound. In gene sequencing, we can now our, we have a model. Gene sequencing has a certain number of errors. We can now uh, detect accurately one base pair out of 250,000 correctly. So we're close to being perfect in something that matters for scientists. In chemistry, we can actually predict molecules' properties based on their shapes, just because of all the molecules we've seen. Um, we're using, in marine biology, something I care a lot about, we're using TensorFlow to sort of track, again, the movement of all of the uh, different mammals that we can understand underneath, underneath the uh, ocean. In conservation, we, have, uh, we're, we now have an online tool where you can use machine learning to study the, the, predicted, the predicted effect of conservation. We have something called Project Sunroof where you can sort of figure out the solar loading and whether solar will work for you, and of course we encourage it. Uh, we took one billion videos in 10 languages and translated them um, uh, into the, the languages that deaf people can read, um, and all of a sudden uh, opening up all of that content for them, again done automatically. Um, our voicemail transcriptions are have been cut in half. We are using neural nets to do handwriting writing recognition as well as reading emojis, if you can imagine that. Um, it won't surprise the women in the audience that there is gender bias in movies. Our tool detected it's a two-to-one bias. Right? That's another example. Um, creativity, right? we have something called the AI duet, which you can play with, which, was a, um, a, which will allow you to play the piano, and it will help you in case you need it. And I certainly need it. Uh, in drawing, we now have drawing assist. You give it an idea of what you want to draw, and it'll draw it much better. Um, in AlphaGo, a game of Go, many of you know what it is. Not only did it win against the top human in the world, but it's also invented new moves that have not been understood and strategies in a game that had existed for 2,500 years in humanity, largely in Asia. Uh, I can go on. Uh, uh, I didn't know it was a hard problem, but sorting cucumbers is difficult. Uh, we can do it automatically more efficiently. That improves farmer productivity. And it goes on and on and on. If you want to see this technology in action, go to Google Photos and type hugs, and it will show you pictures of hugs in your, in your photo album, or dogs, even though you haven't labeled them. How does it do that? It's seen enough pictures. It's learned it. The progress that's occurring is so fast that I think this will go down as the, 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 the year of transformation in I. It's literally the, the year where it started big time. And here we are in Arizona, uh, where there's a, there, we are doing uh, testing of self-driving cars in a nearby town. Um, you can imagine, take a look at Google Reply, uh, Gmail Reply, real personal assistance that can help you get through the day. Do I choose this or do I choose that? We're seeing all of these fundamental science breakthroughs that I talked about. It's interesting that computer science is now the largest major, major in most of the leading universities. So Princeton, Stanford, MIT, so forth and so on. Uh, with a higher and higher percentage of women. 
these computer scientists, when they come out, right, when we graduate them, and thank God, thank God they're incredible, uh, they're going to build platforms of understanding using these tools that we can only imagine. Now that we've seeded the network of technology, now that we've made this code open source, now that we have these supercomputers that can actually run this stuff, this next generation will build systems that are unimaginably intelligent to make us smarter. Now, what does all of this mean? Right? So the most obvious question is the jobs question. We'll talk about that a little bit. My answer is pretty straightforward. Every business person I talk to has a very large number of open jobs, which they can't fill because they don't have people with the right skills. Take those people, give them these tools, their salaries go up, they can fill those jobs. It's not that complicated an argument, and the math works. And more importantly, because of global demographics, there will be a jobs surplus, that is, more jobs than people, because population is in aggregate beginning to decline. So for all sorts of reasons, right, this technology becomes fundamental to humanity for economic growth, job growth, knowledge, peace, and so forth. Now, there's lots and lots of challenges. Industries don't like being disrupted by software, uh, and they don't like it for all, all sorts of obvious reasons. No one ever, you know, and they don't like the impact on them, but no one adds up the jobs that were created elsewhere. These systems, by the way, are not necessarily perfectly precise. Much of the AI work is still imprecise. It has errors in it. So you wouldn't use it for completely life-critical things, at least not in its current state. You would have a human part of the conversation. Um, uh, people are much, more, much less tolerant for, uh, of errors by machines than they are by humans, because we all understand humans are, are fallible. With my Google Home Mini, which is an extraordinary product, so I wonder when a child comes up and discovers that Google Home Mini is far more patient than his or her mom and dad, right? <laughs> What is the impact on that? That's a pretty awesome responsibility for our Google Home Mini team, right? Um, this is just a good metaphor for what happens when these systems are conversational and helpful and so forth. But, but in, in any case, why does every crisis have, be, have to be confrontational? Why can't we just sort of figure out AI ro role models in this case that, do, do, that, that puts this together? To me, there is an awesome power, right, in all of this of shaping both human events, human thought, and so forth and so on, that our industry is facing. Right? We saw this with the Russians. We've see, seen it over and over again. It's important that our industry get this right. And it's important that our industry get this right with the values that all of us, the sort of we the people model that we have for our conference today, do it. Now, why am I so fundamentally optimistic? But when I think about the next 10 years, and I talk to entrepreneurs all day, the number of new billion-dollar corporations that are being founded today based on the underlying platforms that we and other companies have built is astounding. The transformation, the efficiency, the scale, the impact, the improvement in service across supply chain work, distribution models, estimating risk, fraud, you, you name it, this technology is incredibly powerful. Many, many people in this room are part of it. Um, take a look in, in food, um, naturally grown indoor food, free of pesticides, free of things that will hurt you. Um, impossibly good health monitoring through your phone, right? We and other companies are working very hard on this. Uh, the, the CRISPR revolution and whatever it follows it, which George will talk about. Um, in, in that part of the world, they use these biomarkers to try to figure out what biology is really doing. When you do that at scale, you can use these tools to come up with new insights. The educational issue, will change, which has been bedeviled all of us, and we're all frustrated by it, is about to change. Uh, we have entrepreneurs here, including one I know very well, who has articulated, we're going to use this technology to completely change the way we learn. Right? People don't necessarily learn in the way that we were all trained. Maybe people learn in different ways, in smaller segments with more interactivity, and we can determine that. In chemistry, building new compounds and materials, optimal management of energy systems and logistics of distribution if you care about energy management and climate change. If you don't care about climate change, you can at least make the energy system more efficient. Modeling of proteins, other biological systems, and so forth. All of these core platforms are being built now. The most exciting thing that I get to do every day is to try to imagine what would be built because of those platforms. 
What's the good? And by the way, what's the bad? They're not perfect. These are powerful systems. And we obviously need to work on the good ones and, and try to deal with the bad, bad issues as well. To those of you who are entrepreneurs in the audience, what I would say is, my favorite quote is from Henry Ford. When everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, right? That these platforms are a, a sort of a, a, a wind, right? It's a, sort of a system that you, that you navigate in. And that the power of the young people, the ideas, and the values that we try to uh, uh, incorporate in the way we run our conference and our company, I hope we all agree are, are the right ones. I could not be happier to be back, and I'm so glad you guys are back, and enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you very much.